Hello, um, I'm Peter Murphy. I'm uh, retired. In fact, I used to work for English Heritage and oddly enough, I'm recording this uh, in my old office, which is distinctly odd. Um, these days I work with uh, the Chichester and District Archaeology Society, uh, who are obviously Chichester based, but have undertaken quite a deal of work in Chichester Harbour and on the coastline down towards Selsey. Right, hello. Well, um, I'm just going to run through a brief introduction to the archaeology of um, Chichester Harbour, and particularly looking at its intertidal zone. Um, I'm not going to cover everything, obviously. Um, I'll just pick out some of the highlights and suggest a few priorities for future work. So here we are. I hope you can see that. Uh, here's Chichester Harbour. Uh, as you see, it's a complex set of channels uh, with a relatively narrow entrance down at the south at East Head. Um, going around, uh, if we go from about seven o'clock on that diagram, we've got Hailing Island uh, to, the, to the west, uh, including the Turnabury Hill Fort, which I'll come back to. Uh, further up, up the channels, we've got Warmlington, a uh, location of some uh, interest. Uh, Thorny Island, more or less in the middle of the image. Uh, Ch the Chidham Peninsula, the next projection coming southwards. And then over to the right, Fishbourne, Delkey and Chichester. And of course down to the south, uh, you're heading towards Selsey. So I'll refer to most of these places, uh, but um, that's just to give you a bit of orientation really. Well, obviously this area's changed quite a bit. Um, during the Pleistocene, there were very massive uh, paleogeographic changes. Um, for a large part of the Pleistocene, at uh, low uh, periods of low sea level, there was, uh, of course, the Channel River occupying the present channel, the Freshwater River. Um, during periods of higher uh, um, sea level, uh, for example, in the last interglacial, around about 100,000 years ago, uh, sea levels were around about three metres more than those of today. And you can see raised beaches at a number of locations, um, including um, Selsey, um, not so much in the, in the harbour itself. So there have been huge changes uh, paleogeographically over that time period. There have also been fairly major changes um, in the post-glacial period. Uh, first, of first of all, of course, the Overall, sea level has been rising, relative sea level has been rising, and the major channels have been uh, progressively uh, infilled with tidal waters. Nowadays, just uh, at present, coastal change is most um, substantial at the extreme south of the, the harbour, particularly around East Head. And this particular sand promontory, shown on the right, is, uh, has been moving, it's continuing to move. Um, it's gone from being a relatively narrow entrance uh, around about 200 years ago to a rather broad one now with an incurved uh, sand spit. So we've got the long-term Holocene transgression, uh, which probably began around about 6,000 years ago in the deeper channels and it was progressive uh, since then. But uh, much of the harbour probably remained dry land until at least the, the Middle Bronze Age. Uh, there are complications because there are almost certainly offshore barriers of one sort or another, spits uh, in particular, uh, which may well have modified the rate of transgression uh, so that it wasn't a, a simple process. But we don't have any direct um, information about that. Um, anyway, uh, it's a long-term process of submergence, essentially. Uh, some geophysical survey has been undertaken by uh, Titan Environmental Surveys, and they've defined where the main Holocene Paleo channels are. Archaeologically, uh, there is slight evidence for Paleolithic presence, you know, the odd hand axe here and there, a uh, certain amount of uh, Mesolithic and Neolithic activity, and mid to late Bronze Age settlement, uh, burials, metalwork hordes, and the occasional wooden structure. But it's not really until we move into the Late Bronze Age to Early Iron Age uh, that the archaeology becomes 
uh, a little more uh, definite. And one thing that uh, certainly by the Iron Age was established in a big way uh, was salt production, maybe even earlier. Um, there are plenty of Iron Age sultans around the shoreline in the intertidal zone of, um, of Chichester Harbour, um, and many of them continue through into the Roman period. Some uh, locations, such as this one here, uh, it's on the west of Thorny Island, has both bricotage, and the, these are the containers in which salt was evaporated, but also lithics, as you can see. Now, what that means is not entirely clear. It could be uh, that we've got mixed assemblages of, say, Late Bronze Age uh, settlement activity and uh, Iron Age salt production, or it could be that the, these really are Late Bronze Age sultans. We, do, we don't know at the moment. It wouldn't be surprising if they're Late Bronze Age, uh, but um, uh, it does require some more work. Essentially, uh, some test pitting at these sites uh, we see the reddened surfaces, we pick up artefacts, but at the moment all we're seeing is uh, uh, essentially unstratified material, which doesn't really mean a lot. We want a few test pits to try and establish some sort of um, stratigraphic context. For later periods, salt production continues, but the archaeological evidence is less clear. Um, we know that in the 11th century uh, there were sultans recorded in the Doomsday Book, and later maps also show uh, the locations of sultan sites, but uh, there's not a great deal to show for all of that. So anyway, we, we certainly have salt production, maybe from the Late Bronze Age, certainly from the Iron Age, and through into early modern times. So far as other types of sites are concerned, Turnabury, which is uh, towards the south, the southern part of the, um, uh, of the harbour, is, is a fort of some sort. Uh, you could call it a hill fort, though it's not on a hill. It's at a very low elevation. On the right, you can probably see that there are uh, relict paleo channels going up to it, so it was readily accessible by sea. Um, it has one bank around it, it's not heavily defended. Uh, there's been a little bit of sample excavation there, uh, as you can see by uh, Richard Bradley and Mike Fulford. Um, the dating evidence is not good. Um, there's a certain amount of pottery uh, from underneath the bank, 3rd to 1st century BC, so the site prostates that. Um, it may well have been uh, a trading site, it wouldn't be surprising if it was trading with the Mediterranean world. Um, it would have presumably been trading salt and also the other commodities that uh, Roman writers talk about. Um, hides, skins, um, freshwater pearls, which they were particularly keen on, and also slaves may all have been traded from here, but uh, we don't know. This is a tricky site actually to look at because it's covered in woodland, very difficult to trial pit, and we don't know much about what's going on inside it. But it's, it's obviously a site for uh, future uh, investigation. Um, there is continuity within the harbour between the Iron Age and the Roman periods. Um, Hailing Island is quite well known for its temple site. Um, on the left is a plan of the Iron Age temple. Uh, this is all worked by King and Soph. Uh, as you can see, there's a roundhouse, what we'd not just a roundhouse really, inside a square enclosure. It um, is, however, a uh, religious site, um, though which, which deity, we don't know, but uh, there we are. That's its basic structure. And from the first century AD, it was replicated uh, by a Roman structure, which is fundamentally the same thing. It's the same layout just done in stone and done much more monumentally, we can be sure. That central circular structure uh, would have been really quite massive and visible for some distance. So there is this, this element of continuity between the Iron Age and the Roman period. When we get into the Roman period, of course, we have some fairly high status sites. Everybody, well, I expect many of you have been to Fishbourne Roman Palace. Uh, there's a good deal of dispute uh, 
as to who it was actually built for, uh, Toggy Dubnus, the a proposed client king of the Regni uh, is one candidate as an occupant, but uh, there are others have been considered. Um, so the, the, the palace or large villa, whatever you want to call it, uh, originated in the first century. But before that, there was a first century military supply base. So it was one of the uh, locations that was involved in the early stages of the Roman conquest. On the right, um, you can see a head. Well, you can see a sort of head. Um, it's seen better days, obviously. Uh, you probably know that um, Google nowadays, when you attempt to put an image into a presentation, gives you a little helpful caption saying what it thinks it is. And Google's put, uh, captioned this, a loaf of bread, <laughs> which is pretty much what it looks like, isn't it? Um, however, it's not a loaf of bread. It's um, it is a, the head from uh, an imperial uh, colossal statue. Uh, it has been suggested it's Trajan, perhaps erected by um, his successor, Hadrian, uh, as part of the um, uh, facilities that, that led into the harbour. So uh, some fairly monumental things were going on. Um, other settlements, uh, Roman villas are, occur at a number of locations around the Chichester, around, around, around the harbour. Uh, the one at uh, Warblington has been extensively excavated by uh, Cedas. Uh, we did a bit of work there to try to link the villa to the harbour uh, to see if there was a paleo channel that went from the harbour up to the villa. In fact, we did quite a bit of auguring, but there was no real evidence to suggest that um, there was any, any kind of channel there. And it looks rather as though uh, the products of the villa be were being exploited by road, which is not far off. Um, other sites include uh, the settlement on Thorny Island. And just south of Del, Del Quay, there's a pretty major Roman tile production factory. Um, the shoreline there is, is littered with bits of Roman tile. Um, the site's been partly excavated, but as you can see, it's steadily eroding back and uh, more, more debris is ending up on the shore. But um, by and large, apart from these sites, uh, Romans are curiously invisible around the harbour. Um, as you know, where there are Romans, there's usually an awful lot of stuff. Uh, we're not finding that. We're just finding it at, at certain locations. Uh, moving on to the Anglo-Saxon period, we have some early, very early, 7th century activity there um, in involving St Wilfrid and uh, the monastery that he founded at Selsey. This is on the left, uh, part of a cross fragment. Um, and on the right, we have uh, Bosom Church, which is pre-conquest, uh, probably about 1050, 1040, 1050. Um, Bosom was a seat of Earl Godwin and his sons, God, the Godwinsons, um, including, of course, Harold Godwinson, who perished at Hastings. Um, so there were some, you know, quite big guys in operation around the harbour. But again, the archaeology is surprisingly slight um, immediately around it. There's, there is a little bit more stuff down further south. Uh, in the direction of Selsey at Medmury and elsewhere, but not too much in the harbour itself. Medieval, um, well, Bosom remained an important port. Uh, there it is in the background. Uh, we have Ridge and Furrow at uh, very many locations around the harbour. Uh, you can just about make out Ridge and Furrow in the image on the right. Um, there are quite a few isolated churches. Uh, Warblington Church is one. Um, many of them mark the sites of deserted or at least uh, shrunken medieval settlements. Uh, the one at uh, Warblington again has, is, is a, a potential target for investigation, which uh, CDAS will be doing some work on. Uh, not much is known about these settlements in the moment. Um, in terms of higher status stuff, Warblington Castle still partly survives, or at least one corner of, of one of the gate, uh, one of the gatehouses is still there. Uh, this was built in 1514, 
1526 by the Countess of Salisbury, but it was on the site of an earlier moated manor. So there, there, there have been important, fairly high status uh, medieval settlements in the area. So that's just going through up to the end of the, the Middle Ages, essentially. Um, for the rest of the talk, I want to do look at things a little bit more thematically, uh, because these, these are the, the main industries, the main activities that were going on around the harbour. Shipbuilding is one. Um, this began, or remained important up until the 19th century. When it originated, we don't know. Um, the problem with uh, timber shipbuilding is that the infrastructure for the building of a ship um, on a shoreline is slight. Uh, you don't, there isn't very much to it. A number of props and supports and perhaps some kind of slipway if you're lucky, uh, but that's it. Uh, so the, the, the direct evidence for any early shipbuilding is very slight indeed. Um, we have obviously representations of ships around the harbour. On the left is a 17th century coffer with a, a graffito of probably an 18th century sailing vessel on it. And on the right, uh, an 18th century um, gravestone, which is replete with rather lovely maritime imagery over the top. You can probably see the ship in the, the top left. Um, nice things, but they don't tell us an awful lot about shipbuilding until we begin to get uh, documentary evidence, particularly from maps and other sources in more recent times. Uh, marine transportation. Uh, I mentioned Del Quay before, that's Del Quay on the right. Uh, most of the buildings there are 18th century um, or later. Um, I say it probably is a Roman uh, quay originally. I, the only reason for saying that is there, there is a Roman road pointed directly at it. So uh, that seems to be a big clue that there was some kind of uh, uh, Roman installation there. But uh, Del Quay is probably the, one of the major uh, keys serving Chichester itself uh, in historic times. But there are very many small keys and landings all the way uh, round the harbour. Um, we haven't got a clue about how old they are. Um, they could go easily back to prehistory. Uh, obviously the present uh, timber remnants are likely to be from the last couple of hundred years, but um, we really don't know. Um, Pook Quay at, uh, is, is one site that is going to be looked at uh, by Mike Calloway. Uh, oh, I put to West Whistering, I shouldn't have done. I meant Warblington. Pook Quay uh, is still extant as a timber structure. Um, and I did pick up one piece of late medieval pottery there. So there's a hint that it has some rather earlier uh, origins. Um, and Mike and team are planning to do a bit of test pitting. That was about to go ahead uh, when COVID hit us, uh, but that's had to be postponed. But uh, at some point we will be test pitting it and looking for earlier uh, evidence of earlier activity at the site. Um, and then, of course, there's more recent marine transgression uh, transportation. Uh, this is the Sultan's Lock of the uh, Chichester Canal at Burdham. Uh, this was opened in 1822, uh, didn't last all that long. Painted by Turner, you might have seen the painting. Um, it um, nowadays is largely derelict, but uh, it was uh, one of those ventures of the 19th century that perhaps wasn't as successful as it might have been. Hulks. Uh, well, I'm no expert about hulks. There are a lot, uh, a great many. Uh, many of them are comparatively recent. Um, in fact, the one on the left, we have a, by chance, a, a colour photograph from the 1960s, which showed the boat that was there in the 1960s, when it didn't look too bad. It's deteriorated a bit over the last 50 years. Um, the one on the right is rather older, uh, presumably the 19th century, maybe older than that. Uh, some sort of sailing barge, perhaps. But there are a great many hulks and they do uh, they're obviously all deteriorating and they do need uh, more recording uh, before they disappear. And also, of course, some sort of research to establish precisely what they are. <clears throat> 
routeways, terrestrial routeways I'm talking about here. Um, in Chichester Harbour these are known as wadeways for obvious reasons. People uh, would have been able to walk dry shod at low tide but as the tide rose you would have been wading through the incoming tide. Um, the Bosom Wadeway is shown on the left crossing the creek there. On the right you've got a, a routeway which went out to what, is it, what used to be a mill. Um, so that's of comparatively recent date. But again, a lot of these routes, we don't know anything about their origins. Um, they could be, go back an awfully long way. And certainly the uh, Hailing Island Wadeway uh, was looked at by the Mar Maritime Archaeology Trust and was shown to have originated in the uh, probably the 14th century. And this was a time, of course, of, of major um, storminess and uh, uh, erosion. And it was necessary to make a, a permanent connection between, uh, between uh, the island and the mainland, a timber and raised shingle structure. Many of the others may go back to the Middle Ages, we don't know, or even earlier, who can say? Uh, some work needs to be done on all of these routeways. Then we had these rather enigmatic structures, which I'm calling havens. They are basically, if you can envisage it, shingle banks which come out from the shore with a narrow entrance at the top, like that, and um, of totally unknown date. Um, they're definitely artificial. You can see on the right uh, members of CDAS standing along uh, the right-hand arm of one of these havens. Um, they're quite big um, and they, the best explanation that we can come up with is that they were for um, sheltering small vessels. Um, nobody else seems to have come up with a, a better explanation, shall we say. Um, and again, we don't know what date they are. People have claimed uh, that they date back to the Saxon period, but there's absolutely no evidence for that whatsoever. Uh, so uh, these, are, these are sites that could well merit from uh, further work. Fisheries of various sorts. Of course, there are the uh, traditional boat-based fisheries, but we also have stationary fisheries. Um, down at East Head, near the entrance to the harbour, uh, we've recently been looking at uh, some fish traps, and you can see one on the left there. Uh, basically, there's a circular pound of timbers in the foreground and a large V-shaped -V trap behind it. Now, the interesting thing about these uh, fish traps with circular pounds is that they seem to be entirely uh, restricted to the Solent, though they do occur in northern France as well, um, but nowhere else in England. Uh, so they're a Solent-based uh, type of structure. Um, in the Southampton water, Ashlet Creek, uh, one of these uh, types of fish traps has been dated back to the Anglo-Saxon period. And we submitted some samples from the East Head one, expecting to get Anglo-Saxon dates, but we didn't. Uh, we got a, a date indicating that they come from the 16th century AD. Now, it's very strange to have two identical structures, one Saxon, one 16th century, with nothing in between. Um, hard to explain. What we think is going on, what I think is going on, is that people observed the remains of some of the earlier um, structures, the Anglo-Saxon ones, and actually replicated them at a later period. They were in fact archaeologists, and um, uh, that seems to be the best um, explanation, but um, uh, the, you could come up with other um, other means of transmission of the idea from northern France later on, for example. On the right uh, we have the oyster ponds of Emsworth. Um, this was a, a fishery which came to a nasty end when it was uh, polluted by uh, sewage outflow and caused a number of unfortunate deaths. So the, the, the oyster fishery came rapidly to, to an end. But these are two types of stationary fishery which you do find in the harbour. Other industries? Well, brickworks. There are a lot of brickworks around the harbour. It's very suitable clays. Um, brickworks generate an awful lot of brick wasters, and you find uh, spreads of uh, wasters being used as hardcore 
and uh, mainly hardcore in various areas around the place. Nothing much in the way of structures surviving, but um, certainly the locations are clear enough. And we also have tide mills, uh, usually with um, tide ponds behind them into which uh, water was allowed at high tide and then released at low tide, uh, flowing down to, to power the mill. Uh, there are several of these, Langston, Bosom and elsewhere. There have been several attempts at land claim. Um, there doesn't seem to have been much land, land claim in the medieval period, um, but there were fairly major losses of land, uh, particularly in the 14th century. Uh, but once we get into the post-medieval period, um, 16th century onwards, um, there are evidence for, um, uh, for relatively small-scale reclamations. Um, they turn, they moved into a larger scale in the 19th century, uh, and a lot of these attempts to enclose parts of the harbour were entirely unsuccessful. They failed <coughs> very rapidly, and uh, this is an example of one of them, uh, where the, the banks uh, were quickly breached. Uh, then again, uh, we have uh, evidence for the uh, 20th century defences, particularly from the Second World War, uh, notably around Thorny Island. Um, CDES has, is undertaking uh, condition assessment surveys of various types of structures around Thorny Island. Uh, it's not something I know an awful lot about. Um, those who do know about these things, I'm sure, uh, can say more than I can. But there, there's plenty of 20th century defensive structures around. OK, so, well, so what? What next? Um, first thing is we're not short of research agendas. Uh, there are a lot of them. Um, the, this publication by Molas, uh, Chichester Harbour, AONB, uh, Archaeological Research Framework 2004, uh, lists a number of uh, very sensible uh, research projects that could be followed up. Um, we've um, made some suggestions in terms of our routeways project, uh, which um, uh, the terrestrial routeways I've talked about already. Um, and Citizen have made a number of um, uh, proposals in relation to their salt working project. Uh, which was partly published in 2015. So we're certainly not short of research agendas. Um, it only remains to implement them. So thank you very much. I think that gives an introduction to the harbour and a few ideas of where we may be going next. <laughs>